So welcome everyone. Um, this, uh, as you come in, uh, just saying that this uh, is going to be recorded. Um, welcome back to a, a new year and the, the second of our monthly series of the uh, Science of Pandemic Tech, uh, sponsored by WeHealth and the University of Oxford Big Data Institute. Uh, so we put this seminar series together um, to uh, as, as people interested somehow in fighting the pandemic using tech to at the same time be up to date with the absolute latest in available science uh, so that we're supporting public health in using the best possible knowledge base. Uh, and we will cover a range of disciplines. Last time we had some epidemiology, this time we will be having some exposure science. Uh, we've got really exciting and diverse ideas for what will we'll follow. Um, in the future. Uh, but meantime, we'll cover a range of topics and try and keep everyone involved in this area up to speed with, with what's cool in science. So I wasn't originally going to give this introduction. So uh, this is me. Um, I'm a uh, at the University of Arizona. I'm a co-chair of this series. I um, head up research at WeHealth. Um, and I love interdisciplinary work um, and I love calculating probabilities. And so I've been involved in risk scoring um, and other uh, research regarding uh, risk analysis in, in, in how it can interface with pandemic tech. Um, and there are other organizers on the line, Jolene Elizabeth and Luca Ferretti are, are also co-chairing this series. Um, but mainly, it's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker. So when uh, the pandemic started and I got into this area of pandemic tech and was sort of coming up to speed with a lot of new public health in a hurry, I hadn't realised what a, what a gulf there was between epidemiology and exposure science. And I was extremely lucky to stumble across an expert in the field of quantitative microbial risk assessment at, at the University of Arizona. That was Amanda Wilson. And she was able to give me a crash course extremely quickly. And part of that crash course was to read everything Chuck Hast has written on a bunch of stuff. Uh, so it is an enormous pleasure to then, you know, have, have him come and speak. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I think it's pretty self-evident from the name of the field of quantitative microbial risk assessment that this, this is something that we in pandemic tech should be um, playing close, uh, paying close attention to. Uh, but it was, uh, it was very surprising to me um, how many other people in public health had limited uh, knowledge of the area. And so when techies asked public health people all sorts of questions, they often didn't get the right answer because they weren't speaking to the right expert. And Chuck really is that expert, you know, with an incredibly eminent career and so basically being a, a guru of this field. Um, so with that, it is really my great pleasure to hand it over to him to, to tell us about how he sees the pandemic. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, you need to stop screen sharing so I can screen share. There we go. Okay, is the screen coming through okay now? Looks great. Okay, so what I want to do is talk to you about how um, what we do in quantitative microbial risk assessment can help inform understanding and control ultimately of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I'll start out with an introduction. I'll go through the framework for quantitative microbial risk assessment, including elements of dose response and exposure assessment. I'll cover some questions that have been asked in the context of SARS-CoV-2 um, one being, what is the significance of RNA measurements? What are the implications for ventilation and physical distancing? How clean is clean? And then finally, the issue of fomites. So quantitative microbial risk assessment is a mathematical modeling approach where we 
desire to estimate the risk of infection and illness when a population is exposed to microorganisms in the environment. And it has five separate elements, hazard ID, dose response, exposure assessment, risk characterization, and risk management. And I'll be focusing primarily on the dose response and exposure assessment pieces of this field. Um, before I do that, this, this crossed my um, screen last week and I thought I'd put it up. This is from the SAGE committee in the UK, um, which put up this very, very detailed process diagram of COVID-19 transmission from an infector to a susceptible. And my purpose of, of showing this figure is not to emphasize all the boxes, but to just call your attention uh, to the box in the middle. On the left, we have the infected person. On the right, we have a susceptible population. And in the middle, we have the environment. And by training, I'm an environmental engineer. Why are environmental engineers and environmental scientists relevant to this problem? Because to get from the infected to the susceptible, there has to be fatent transport through the environment. And that's really what we specialize in for whole categories of pollutants, microorganisms, certainly being one of them. So to get to dose response, um, I want to put up this quote from over 60 years ago now by Meinel and Stocker. And it really outlines the dichotomy that exists in how people think about the relationship between exposure to microorganisms and likelihood of an adverse effect. Uh, there are um, two competing hypotheses that they outlined 60 some odd years ago. One is the hypothesis of, hypothesis of independent action. That is at a microscopic level, it only takes one hit for an adverse effect to occur. Now you may be throwing a lot of hits at a susceptible, but only some of them hit the target. However, if one and only one hits the, if only one hits the target, that suffices. The competing hypothesis is that is the cumulative damage of many, many, many hits that each in and of themselves are imperfect to cause the damage. And, and in this paper by my still, my Nellen Stocker, uh, which is a very readable paper, um, they actually did some experimentation with bacteria and demonstrated in fact, that hypothesis of independent action was the one that appeared to be relevant and useful and descriptive of the situation. And so our dose response analysis stems from this concept of independent action. The simplest dose response relationship that we can have is the exponential on the left. And I promise these are the only two equations that will be in my talk. The exponential is derived if you have a random or a Poisson distribution of organisms in replicate doses or exposures, that one organism is capable of colonizing to produce an adverse effect if it arrives at an appropriate site. This is the independent action assumption. And that each organism has an independent identical probability of surviving to reach and colonize at an appropriate site. So if you combine those three distributions, the likelihood or the proportion of sub subjects in the population that are administered an average dose D that have the adverse effect is given by the exponential on the bottom of the first column with K being the probability of an individual organism surviving and colonizing. A slightly more complicated dose response model is the beta Poisson, which arises from the same underlying assumptions as the exponential, but we allow the survival probabilities themselves to have a statistical distribution, namely the beta distribution. And with that, the approximate solution to that is given by the equation on the bottom of the second column, 
The exact solution is actually a confluent hypergeometric function, but in most cases, this approximation suffices. And so with those two models, we've been able to fit all microbial dose response relationships that we've ever examined. And I'll give you some examples in the next slide. But just to visualize what those two models mean, uh, both of these slides represent a plot of the proportion of a population with the adverse effect on the y-axis and the dose normalized by the N50, the 50% 50 effective dose on the x-axis with the exponential given in the dash black lines and then the beta Poisson with different values of the alpha given by the various solid lines. And if you simply look at the left-hand panel at the moment, you would be tempted to say, well, gee, maybe there's a threshold. But in fact, if you replot those same curves on a log-log scale, you see that at low dose, there is no threshold in the sense that there's no average population exposure at which the expected proportion of subjects is equal to zero. And also at low doses, there's a slope of one-to-one -one on the log-log plot, meaning that we have low dose linearity. So independent action dose response theory says that there will be no true threshold and there's a linear low dose response relationship. In other words, there's no such thing as a minimal infectious dose. And that's a concept that, I mean, I've been doing microbial dose response now for close to 40 years. And the minimal infectious dose um, idea keeps on rising to the surface when every new instance of an important microorganism comes to fore. It doesn't exist. It's a dose response. So just some examples of where we fitted dose response models either exponential or beta Poisson. We have probably over 30 uh, organisms that we've looked at at this point. Viruses, bacteria, and protozoa by the ingestion route, by the inhalation route, which is germane to us here, or by other routes as well. Megalaria was um, uh, ocular exposure and Staph aureus is dermal exposure. Every one of these can be fit by either the exponential or beta Poisson, meaning that every one of these is linear low dose and no threshold. And just to show you what happens with coronavirus. So uh, in 2010, after SARS-1, I had a visiting postdoc, Tura Watanabe, who is now on the faculty at Yamagata in uh, Japan do a systematic literature review for coronavirus and related virus data sets to develop dose response relationships. And we, we wound up finding over a dozen usable data sets. The one on the right is one example, which is my um, working example that I'm using for SARS-CoV-2 risk analysis at this point. Uh, data on human uh, coronavirus 229E by nasal installation, and it fits an exponential dose response relationship. The symbols are the data points and the a red curve is the fitted exponential with a constant of 0.054, meaning essentially that about, there's a one in 20 probability that an individual coronavirus 229E when exposed to a human would survive and colonize and grow to produce an adverse effect. And I'll give you the citation to a preprint on this. This is now currently in revision. So say some microorganisms get into the environment, a room, for example. What happens within the venue of a room? Well, this was some simulations that another student of mine, Shamia Hawk, uh, did about a decade ago, uh, you see a, um, a little magenta dot at the bottom of uh, each of those figures. We assume a large number of five micron dry aerosols 
are released with zero velocity at that location. This was motivated by the 2001 anthrax situation. So simulating an envelope being opened perhaps within a room. And then we did computation of fluid dynamics using um, Eulerian CFD to model the fluid flow in the room space and Lagrangian particle tracking to simulate the motion of five micron particles as they migrate within the room space. Um, and in this particular room, and you see a 2D slice at the center line here, the magenta uh, trails and the magenta dots simulate the particles on the left hand after only about four minutes post release. And on the right hand, um, two th uh, excuse me, yeah, four minutes post release, the right hand one after uh, 30 minutes or so post released. The right hand one represents uh, the time required for three ear changes in the room. So a couple of things that you see here, first of all, there's rapid dispersion of particles within the room due to velocity flow of the room ventilation. The fresh air is coming in at the bottom left. The exhaust air goes out on the upper right. And even after three residence times, there's significant dispersion of particles remaining in the room um, above the flow of ventilation remaining. And so imagine an individual might be exposed to that room air. This might represent considerable exposure. Note also in both panels, um, there's evidence of significant heterogeneity. If you look at the upper left corner of the right-hand panel, the concentration in that corner is greater than, for example, the concentration in the lower right. So complete mixing, while it may be a, a an important approximation is not a description of the exact state of nature in a ventilated room. And the other aspect is that the exposure far from a source, remember that magenta um, square at the bottom is where the initial charge of aerosol comes from. Exposure far from the source may still be significant and may be possibly as much as near the source. Now, this is an interesting uh, paper. As far as I know, it only exists in preprint. I don't think it's been published. So the, the Guangzhou restaurant outbreak of COVID-19 occurred um, in March uh, of the um, uh, outbreak in China. And this was a cluster of people primarily within that blue zone at the upper left of the room. What Lee et al. did was did, did computational fluid dynamic modeling of the ventilation in that room. There was uh, air being introduced from the upper right, as is common in Asia. There was no fresh air makeup in this room. It was simply a recirculation with cooling and conditioning. And no filtration to speak of as well. And so um, sort of toward the left-hand third, you see an individual seated at a table with blue. That was the presumptive index case. And everybody else in that zone in red converted um, symptomatically to COVID-19. And so this presents a strong case that it was room ventilation that resulted in transmission far field from the individual index case uh, that resulted in the infection. And everybody else outside that recirculating zone of the air conditioning had no apparent um, adverse disease outcomes. So it was confined, confined simply to the recirculation of fine droplets and aerosols that resulted in spread from the index patient to the other cases in that restaurant outbreak. Now, a second question I've been, um, you know, asked to comment on is how about RNA? There have been a lot of measurements of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, not just in clinical samples, 
but in environmental samples. Um, measurement of the RNA is not synonymous with infectious viable virus. This figure on the right, which again, as far as, far as I know, has not yet been published, but is in preprint, was a meta-analysis of uh, clinical samples during the first four or five months of the outbreak. And the authors took data where there was attempts to culture the virus from the clinical sample, as well as where the RNA copies per ml of viral transport fluid were measured. And basically, until you get to very, very high RNA copy number, maybe 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th, there's a very low probability of finding infectious virus in clinical samples. Now, when you get to the environment, environmental transport may reduce the ratio of viable virus to culturable RNA. And it's the history of the sample being transported in the environment that will affect that ratio. And we really don't have data to say much beyond that. Uh, the problem is sampling for cultural viruses in the environment requires very careful sample collection procedures. And there are perhaps only half a dozen laboratories around the world that are capable of doing such samples from, um, from sampling air in clinical or environmental uh, venues. For other viruses where ratios have been measured, there's indication that you can get anywhere from 10 to perhaps over 10,000 RNA gene copies per, vi per viable virion. So measuring RNA is by all means not necessarily an indicator of the existence of viable virus. And there's one example, a bit aside from what many of the audience are interested in. There is a lot of work now looking at measuring SARS-CoV-2 RNA in wastewater, and it's a good surveillance technique, but there's absolutely no indication yet of viable SARS-CoV-2 virus in wastewater. It's the fragments, presumably, of infection of the gastrointestinal epithelia. <clears throat> now, another old wives' tale, if you will, is the six foot and 15 minute guideline. And I really can't do any better than copying what Jones and et al. wrote um, in the middle of last year as to how the two meter or the six foot rule originated. And ultimately it goes back to some very, very crude experiments that were done in 1897 by Fluga in which they took culture plates and put them at various distances from an emitter uh, emitting bacteria, and they found beyond one to two meters um, where the culture plates were located, they didn't see any deposition on the plates. Now, <clears throat> that's a very crude technique. Anybody who's done bacterial culture knows that you really don't have um, a usable measurement anywhere outside either 10 to 100 or 30 to 300 uh, colonies per plate. And so there may very well have been small amounts of emission beyond that that Fluga was unable to measure. In the 1940s, people started looking at, at the use of uh, cameras to do imaging of people sneezing or coughing. And what's noteworthy about that 48 reference is 10% of the participants had Back aerosols with bacteria that were collected nine and a half feet away. Again, a, an 80 year old study, that's really what people are hanging their hat on for the six foot or one to two meter um, assessment. And Jones et al concluded um, on the left hand side that the six foot rule is based on outdated science Distribution of viral particles is affected by numerous factors, including airflow, and I've indicated by the CFD results in the work of Hawk, how room ventilation can result in aerosols migrating a great deal of distance away from a source. 
Activities such as coughing and shouting, where the particles are emitted with velocity, can cause transport well beyond two meters. And the risk should be based on multiple factors. Just as one example, Bariba um, in JAMA in 2020 published this um, photograph. It's actually a video if you go to the original reference where uh, she induced um, subjects to sneeze and then measured by high-speed camera emissions of the aerosols from the sneeze. And they were clearly propelled well beyond seven to eight meters in distance. There have been other studies that have shown that talking can release bioaerosols. In fact, in a, in a paper published um, late last year, there was a review of so-called um, aerosol generating pr uh, procedures. And it's been very controversial in social media amongst the medical community. But the suggestion from those reviews is you probably generate more aerosols in an infected patient by routine breathing than you do during so-called aerosol generating procedures. Um, particles less than 100 microns have sufficient time to be re-entrained in ventilation. There was an older literature that many of the medical community adopted that said anything less than five meters, five microns would rapidly settle. That really disobeys fundamental laws of aerosol physics. You have to go at least to 100 microns before a particle will drop off in short distance from a source and not be re-entrained in ventilation. The 15 minutes is actually more puzzling and I haven't been able to chase that down reliably yet. There are some older studies on smallpox where smallpox was transmitted from a patient with only a 15 minute exposure. But if anybody has any leads on where the 15 minutes come from, I'd love to hear them because I've been working on that with very little avail. Now, what do we do if six feet and 15 minutes are not good enough? Well, the Jones et al paper, and I'll give you the full citation to this in my last slide, came out with this um, uh, hazard matrix. And I tend not to be a big believer in hazard matrices for a lot of technical reasons, but they're a useful way to communicate complex levels of risk that are multi multifactorial in nature. And the key thing that Jones came up with in dividing between red, uh, orange, and green areas are that if you categorize ba based on indoor versus outdoor, by ventilation quality in indoors, by population density, by duration, and by mask wearing, this is a useful way to assess the likely degree of risk um, to COVID-19 in various circumstances. How would we get more quantitative? Well, if I think of an ideal, you know, what I'd like to have is some measurement of time integrated exposure. So if you imagine that we had the availability of a way to measure concentration in the location where an individual is breathing and multiply their concentration times the breathing rate and then integrate over time to get an integrated daily dose, let's say, we could now use a dose response curve to project risk. Is this so far-fetched? I don't know, but this is what's done all the time in radiation dosimetry. And in fact, it's done in industrial hygiene in looking at exposure to a number of toxic gases where there are uh, personal exposure sensors that are used and uh, measured on a daily basis to assess exposure and risk in hazardous environments. How do we know how clean is clean or how clean is safe? And this is not a new question. I was on a National Academy committee. This is the cover of the report that we wrote in um, the early 2000s. 
when we were trying to understand what the decision-making process was for reopening uh, the facilities that were contaminated by the anthrax release. We can never get to zero risk. We need to balance marginal risks and marginal benefits. What this means is either directly or indirectly, we need to value the consequences that might remain after an attempted remediation. We have to look at non-uniformity of who, who incurs the costs and who benefits from the result. What this really means is this is not purely a technical question. It's a, a social deliberation that needs to be undergone. And I would just point you to a set of tools called Dolly's for Disability Adjusted Life Years or Quali's Quality Adjusted Life Years, which could be useful to integrate both morbidity and mortality uh, consequences into one metric. And uh, the World Health Organization Burden of Disease um, reports do use the Dolly framework as a means to assess uh, various adverse health outcomes throughout the world. There are some measurements of Dolly's from COVID-19 impacts that have started to make their way into the literature, although I would say they're incomplete, primarily because I don't think we understand yet the long tail, and it may very well be that the long tail morbidity has as much of a consequence in a Dolly or Quali framework as does um, mortality. Now, what about fomite? So first of all, what a fomite is, is a inanimate surface that may be contaminated with a microorganism such as SARS-CoV-2. The microorganism gets deposited to the surface. It needs to survive until somebody touches the surface. Whereupon it's transferred to fingers. It persists on the fingers in the absence of hand washing and gets transferred to the mouth, nose, or eyes where it can use those as portals of entry to exert an adverse effect. Now, each of those bullets represent some process that happens with less than a probability of one. First of all, you have to have the contamination. There has to be survival. And the literature suggesting, depending on the surface, hours to maybe a couple of days, there needs to be transference to fingers. A lot of data shows you may only get 10% transference of organisms on the surface to fingers. What is the persistence on fingers? And then what is the transference to mouth, nose, and eyes? And again, that might only be 10 or 20%. Now, as I was putting the outline of this paper together, there was a very important paper that appeared about um, two weeks ago in Environmental Science and Technology Letters by a um, uh, international group. And what they did was they looked at a town in Massachusetts during the first wave of the outbreak in 2020. They measured high touch surfaces for RNA of SARS-CoV-2. They did incorporate estimates for potential ratios of viable virus to RNA uh, gene copies, and they did an overall QMRA for this scenario, and they estimated the risk of infection from touching a contaminated surface was low, less than five in 10,000 by QMRA, suggesting that fomites play a minimal role in SARS-CoV-2 community transmission. And almost contemporaneously with this, um, <coughs> I, Joe Allen and, at Harvard and Lindsey Marr at Virginia Tech put out an op-ed in the Washington Post, essentially saying that we're devoting too much to excessive cleaning of surfaces as a response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, I want to state two things that are very important. First of all, we're not saying that routine cleaning should be 
dismissed, that still remains important as you would ordinarily before the COVID-19 outbreak. Hand washing still remains important. And our editorial, our op-ed was focused solely on community-based uh, situations and not hospital health care and long-term care facilities. And so are we devoting too much time in those settings to surface cleaning? I believe so. Hand washing is the main barrier against that low risk, but non-zero exposure route. So with that, I'll conclude by saying QMRA is an important tool and it's complementary to epidemiological methods. It allows us to ask what if questions and highlight most significant uncertainties. With the absence of thresholds, we need to address full on the acceptable risk level using deliberative approaches. And obviously there's a lot of room for improvement uh, for modeling and development of personal dosimetry approaches. A long list of collaborators, um, but I think I'll go and leave my last slide um, up. And those of you want, that wanna get a screenshot of some of the references, feel free. These are a number of the papers of mine that I've cited, my and my group, and the Jones paper with that risk matrix at the very bottom. So with that, let me stop sharing. And I look forward to taking your questions. Great. So I'll just uh, uh, bring up the first two questions quickly. The first question was, will there be a recording available? <laughs> you know that this was an excellent presentation. And the answer, which I will give, is yes, a recording will be available. Um, and. Uh, Jolene has posted to the chat the link that you can go to to sign up for the, the mailing, which will include links to the recording once it is available. We're still doing a few things on the tech side to make everything work smoothly on YouTube and whatever, but definitely recording is coming out. So that's the first question. Um, and the second question is about the personal doximetry from Adam Fowler. Um, so are there existing risk formulae we can apply given you know, that we collect all of this risk estimation data? Well, if we were to have a, an integrated dose measurement, <clears throat> then one could go directly to a dose response curve, such as the one I, I put up for 229E and get the risk that corresponds to that daily exposure. So yes, if we had the risk measurement, then one could certainly do that. So yes, you're basically saying that's our job as the techies. We need to do the, we, you know, the formula is not the problem, it's the measurement. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Okay, I will let Larry Singer ask his own question. My question yeah. is, um, as these new strains come out with higher trans, uh, transmitting rates, does that impact the calculation? So the, the basics of dose response are that the risk is a function of the dose. And as I understand what's known at this point about the new strains is they're primarily acting by virtue of having higher colonization in an infected subject and therefore greater remission. And so there's not yet evidence that there's a greater intrinsic potency. Now, if that arises, then yes, certainly we might want to talk about shifting the dose response curve to account for that. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, question was again about, you yeah. know, just where the list, the link is. The link <laughs> is in the chat. Um, but secondly, there is in the second aspect of it, which is, are you willing to share your beautiful uh, LaTeX PDF slides with us? Um, yeah, I, I'm just nervous because I've copied a lot of figures from publications. And so there's a copyright issue. Um, but, you know, let me just type my email in chat and... Uh, I invite you to email me directly and 
We've all done that. We've all taken a few shortcuts yeah. Yeah. <laughs> here and there such that, you know, we will share privately. Okay, there are questions coming in in chat as well as q and I'm going to ask you to please put them in the Q&A, but meantime, there is one from Amanda Wilson, who I will let talk. Hi, <laughs> Roz, it was really great to hear your talk. Uh, thank you. I'm interested in the development of those response curves that account for variability of risk factors among a population, such as immunocompromised individuals, where we're interested in QMRA within a healthcare context for patients. And I know um, Dr. Weir's done some of that work around Legionella recently looking at how do we address you know, risk of illness among different demographic groups. So I was curious if you could talk about the development of that within QMRA briefly. So, by the way, hi, Amanda. Um, in terms of uh, susceptible groups, I think there are two ways to approach that, that problem. Obviously, it would be difficult to do human studies with even other coronaviruses and susceptible subpopulations. But what we might be able to do is if there are good estimates of exposure, perhaps in a um, well-defined disease cluster, so that we could get attack rate amongst those subpopulations, we could always shift the dose response curve to match the finding in an outbreak investigation. So that's um, entirely possible. Okay, next question is from Drew and I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, so I'll leave it there. Uh, Drew, would you like to ask? Hi, Dr. Haas. Uh yeah, thanks. My question is maybe you could just comment on the balance between communicating action with the public that they can like actually do, such as six feet distancing with the science that you discussed today, that that might not actually be a uh, normative standard of risk consider, considered safe. Sure. Hi, Drew. Um, so I think, the, you know, the best analogy that I've heard, which has been widely used by Lindsay Moore and Kim Prather is to think of a cigarette smoker. How far away would you want to be from a cigarette smoker so that you weren't inhaling some of their secondhand smoke? And so from a risk communication mm -hmm. point of view, I think that analogy works. Um, and it works physically because a lot of cigarette smoke or micron size particles. Um, so I would start there as an alternative messaging strategy. Great, the next question is Ryan Sinclair, who I'll give the <laughs> mic to. You're talking, all, all the veterans of our uh, microbial risk workshops are uh, <laughs> asking questions. Hi, Ryan. Oh, hi there. Hey, um, nice talk. I was just wondering about what you think about the priority for a need to do more of these naturalistic observational studies of people wearing masks in public, thinking about the, the QMRA in reference to, you know, um, transmission in, in public areas. And um, if, if uh, you know, we had to prioritize, would that be a, a higher priority to do one of those studies? Or would you, would, you know, all of these other uh, areas as well are, are important? Just that I didn't see uh, mask wearing in the in the presentation, so I was just wondering what you thought about that. Well, no, I think I think mask wearing is is clearly very important. It's a, um, you know, it's a barrier. You know, the one figure I didn't put up, which I was tempted to, um, you know, Ian Mackay from Australia has developed his Swiss cheese model, and you really need to approach um, control of transmission by thinking of multiple layers of Swiss cheese, each being a separate barrier. And it's only when you put enough of those layers together so that the holes don't all coincide that you have a highly effective systematic way to mitigate risk. And so masks are clearly a very important layer of that Swiss cheese. Now, in terms of mask wearing, I think, you know, there are at least two things that need to be done. One is um, how do we get better QAQC into 
non-medical, non-surgical consumer grade masks that are widely used in the community. I think that's a, um, that's a glaring need. And then the other is a educational aspect is how do we promote mask wearing behavior in various venues? Thanks. Okay, and the next question I'm calling on Gustavo Lacerdo. Um, okay, hi. Um, so I was uh, interested um, in the in the beta plus on model, um, specifically, you know, when we talk about uh, the beta distribution that refers to a probability, uh, uh, supposedly probability of, of the virus surviving, I imagine, and and the reason you put a beta is because you, you're trying to model some variability in this. So I'm wondering uh, what kind of variability do we see, and you know is what are you looking at? Is it across different people, across different environments? Well, so the way I describe that distribution is the, the distribution of the successful interaction probability between the virus and the host. Mm -hmm. So it's a function both of the variability of the host and potentially the variability of the virus. And you recall there's that parameter alpha. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> as alpha gets larger and larger, that uh, beta distribution approaches a very, very narrow bell-shaped curve. And the limit of alpha equals infinity is the exponential. As alpha becomes smaller and smaller, um, let's say below about 0.5, then the distribution starts to have a mode at zero. And so it can be highly skewed. Now, for, well, for the microorganisms that we've looked at, in general, the, the lowest values tend to be about 0.2. So you're not getting to the extremely skewed behavior of the beta distribution, only moderately skewed. So it's either symmetric or slightly um, right-tailed. And I'm wondering if there's any insights we can get you know, b based on the shape of this uh, beta distribution of the fitted beta distribution? I you know, I, I think that's, I think that's a, a wonderful point. And, um, you know, whether it reflects something that we can ascribe to the host or to the pathogen remains unknown. Okay. Okay, the next question is uh, Ron Revest. I've given you the mic. I think I've given you the mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, you asked for dosimeters. A number of us have been working on Bluetooth based smartphone uh, apps for measuring distances and so on, too, uh, as, a, as a proxy for measuring dose. And I was wondering if you had any comments on, on that line of research and thinking uh, or suggestions for making it work well. Well, you know, um, and when I had my uh, practice run through with Joanna last week, um, you know, one of the things that occurred to me is clearly, at least in the indoor environment, um, a key aspect of dosimetry is going to be the quality of ventilation in the room. And, you know, what is the opportunity to develop smart ventilation systems that could signal to a dosimeter what the quality of ventilation is that an individual is being exposed to. So, you know, that's, that's one thing that, that occurred to me. And I don't know the degree that's being looked at, but, um, you know, that might be an interesting area to start thinking about. Just comment. I hope there are people from Google and Apple here who will, uh, who will allow the um, anonymous collection of uh, ventilation information from beacons. That would be very, very, very useful for risk assessment if that were allowed. Sorry, I have to put that plug in. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> um, all right, and another question is from Kelly Reynolds. Um, Hi, Hi nice to see you, great talk. I Hi, wonder Kelly. if, you know I'm not completely objective on this, uh, on this comment, <laughs> but could you comment more on the quantitative evidence we have that we're putting too much time into cleaning services? And I did note your point about 
you're not necessarily talking about healthcare infection prevention, but in community environments. But you know, you mentioned the Swiss cheese model, and as a member of the community, I can certainly clean my surfaces and wash my hands, but I don't have a whole lot of control over ventilation in different environments. And I'm looking at next week, the University of Arizona is opening classes and we're getting ready to teach in person with the six foot distancing and wearing masks. And just wonder if you could talk about what we know relative to infection control interventions and any quantitative evidence of their relative efficacy. Well, so as far as I know, um, there really haven't been any trials with and without fomite control surface cleaning for SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, as you probably, I'm sure you know, Kelly, there have been such studies for influenza mm -hmm. and it seems to be a mixed bag in that case. Um, you know, my, my comment is simply based on the following. If, you know, if you had a million dollars to spend at UA to reduce the risk, how much of it would be better spent on ventilation, PPE, and so forth versus having all the uh, custodial staff do hourly cleaning of every touch surface? And I would argue that the former is probably money much better spent than the latter. Okay, so I have an anonymous attendee who I don't think I can allow to talk, so I'll read out the question. Um, do you know of any data source or paper that technologists should look at to get a sense of how ventilation quality in a room can influence risk? Yeah, I should, you know, I, I didn't put it in my slides. There's a, there's a very large FAQ that a group of people, including myself, have worked on, on aerosols and indoor air quality. And I would suggest you start there. Probably the best way to find it is do a Google search on <clears throat> my name, uh, another author is Corsi, C-O-R-S-I, Another author is Jimenez, and then aerosols. And I'm sure with that, you'll get to that document. If not, um, you know, I can track it down. And uh, I guess, Joanne, if I forward it to you, you can forward it to the list. That's right. I can forward it. I think that would be great. I think, you know, anything we can do to, to, yep. to get the technologists onto yep. this problem yep. will be good. Yep. So yep. please yep. do forward it. Yep. Um, so um, I normally don't take two from the same person, but I'm going, I have a soft spot for Amanda and she, her question's really a really good follow-up. So Amanda. Thanks Joanna and me again. <laughs> um, going back to this idea of relating ventilation uh, quality to the smartphone apps, I was thinking about CO2 sensors and how that's been sort of a very rough look at ventilation or um, you know, a measurement of occupancy in rooms. And I was wondering, do you know of CO2 sensors that have like an app capability or what are your thoughts on using that as a, a proxy for air quality? Well, I, so I don't know if any of them have, um, have Bluetooth output. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of issues with CO2 sensors in general. They're a good idea. <clears throat> and, you know, certainly in Arizona, particularly during winter when you're I think likely to leave the windows open more. They're probably a great idea. The problem is when you have um, non-outdoor ventilation, but air filtration as a solution, you still can good, get good air quality from a microbiological point of view with high CO2. So, you know, low CO2 is good. High CO2 is not necessarily bad. And I think there are a number of people in the field who would say that if you're relying on outdoor ventilation, you want to strive to get CO2 values below 600 parts per million as a metric of good ventilation. Okay, so uh, Stephen Zerfus, let me just find you to ask a question. 
There we go, Stephen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm curious to know if there are any day-to-day -day, uh, in practice signs that we might be on the lookout for for air ventilation from a microbial perspective, similar to I think what you were just talking about. Like, is this grocery store, um, are there signs that this would have good ventilation versus this one? Not, you know, not really from visual inspection. You know, without doing without doing measurements, without um, having data, just from uh, what I would call windshield survey, it's really impossible. I see. Thank you. I mean, you know, one of the things a number of people have been arguing for is maybe um, grocery stores, restaurants, etc., ought to go down the same road as the lead certification and start developing certifications mm -hmm. for indoor ventilation. Um, there are organizations that have various scorecards, but they haven't been widely adopted yet. So I think Luca Ferretti has a question. Luca, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, Charles. Thanks for the terrific talk. I have a question about the 15 minutes rule. Since you, you were a bit uh, skeptical about it. Now, what is your best guess based on similar pathogens? So is I, there some linearity or? It, it, it all comes down to the dose. And you know, the point of dosimetry is you're, if you're exposed to a, a low dose for a long period of time, it's going to have a similar adverse effect to a large dose over a small period of time. Okay, okay. Kerry Hamilton. You want to ask a question? <laughs> sure. I have a question. So I was just wondering, like, what the progress is on real-time monitoring of, uh, you know, bioaerosols, and you know, are we getting to the point where we could do that, or are we very far still? I, you know, hi, Carrie. Carrie is my most recent PhD student. Um, <laughs> Carrie, I haven't done, you know, a lot of deep diving into the, you know, personal biosensor area. Um, you know, I mean, ATP obviously isn't going to work for viruses. Um, you know, I don't know the feasibility of other technologies, but it's probably probably worth a significant um, look at the literature to see that what's available. The, you know, the, the, the big issue with, with biosensors, and I tend to be somewhat of a sensor skeptic when it comes to microorganisms, is the difficulty is really getting the microorganisms to the sensor. You know, because we're talking about such dilute concentrations that sample concentration and cleanup, even in air, becomes an issue. Okay. So, believe it or not, I think we, I, you got through all the questions <laughs> just in time and on the hour. So, thank you so much. That was an extremely interesting talk and I think very challenging for those of us in tech to, you know, throw down the gauntlet and instead of saying this is what you can do with the existing tech to tell us this is what you should be doing somehow, <laughs> go figure it out. And uh, that's exactly the kind of exchange that we want to keep having here um, to get people who, who, who can really direct what from a public health point of view that tech is needs to achieve. Um, so thank you again. Um, and uh, Please, uh, if you're not already on our mailing list, be on it. We will have more great talks. I don't know who the next one is going to be yet, but but we like to be provocative and we like to bring new ideas in. So um, I, I hope many of you will come for, for next month. Thank you.